Hi, I'm Jim Baratko. I'm the Director of Worship Arts here at First Church in West Hartford. Uh, so thank, uh, thank you for being with us. I'm going to be joined a little bit later by Susan Azes as we talk about changing the visual perspective of worship on Sunday morning. Now, many of you, I'm sure, have this similar situation where you have a number of pews that are set up, they're fixed, they don't move. You have the pulpit on this side, and you have the lectern on that side, and actually in this space they have the choir right behind both of those, and that's the traditional setup for music and worship every Sunday. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do creatively to take a look at your worship space and change that visual perspective, which adds an element of excitement and engagement for your parishioners. I'm gonna be talking about a couple of things that you can do that won't cost anything, and I'll also cause, talk about some things about lighting that will cost a certain amount of money, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, puppets and how they might be able to change the perspective of worship on a Sunday morning. So acoustically, one of the things that I did in, in, in analyzing this space is to find where the choir would sound the best. Uh, we have carpeting, we have uh, cushioned pews, and we used to have drapes on the windows, which tended to deaden the sound in here quite a bit. However, I found that by sit standing on the steps here in the front of the, between the lectern and the pulpit, was one of the best spots for the choir to project themselves into the meeting house. It's also advantageous for the piano, which is, happens to be in this le general location as well, so I can conduct the choir from the piano in a very close uh, proximity. I also have the ability to record myself and play it back on the pipe organ. Uh, I realize not many of churches may have that capability, but if you do, uh, I have set it up so I set, I play the recording or I record the music for the choral anthem first and then on a Sunday morning I play that recording, it plays the pipes and I conduct, it's kind of like conducting karaoke. So it's an unusual uh, situation but it works out very well. We do about 80% of our anthems uh, from this space. About 10% of the time when we have an anthem that does require me to direct and play the organ at the same time, I have the choir set up on a set of stairs that are just before the altar here. So this adds a big difference in the space, but also it has the beauty of this solid wall directly behind me, so it helps project the sound forward in a tremendous fashion. Uh, so we do about maybe 5% of the time here. If we're doing an a cappella piece on a Sunday morning, uh, particularly if it's a very challenging a cappella piece and people need to have the best uh, oral experience as a singer to be able to do that, one of the things that we might do is have the choir up here in the balcony. And so that way we're singing from behind the members of the congregation. Uh, this is a great space because we're closer to the ceiling up here we have a solid wall on that side in the back, so it has the ability to focus the sound on the singers in individually as they sing, and it projects the sound beautifully out to the meeting house. Uh, we do this for some special occasions. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things that we do is we'll talk about the, the colossal puppets for the nativity service. I have a trombone choir. I have six trombones on this side, and an antiphonal six trombones on that side and the choir in the middle. And we do the entire service with just the, uh, the uh, trombones and the choir from up in the balcony and no uh, music from the front. And that brings us full circle back to here in the transept, right in the middle of the meeting house here in the congregation. So this is an, a unique place to sing because it has a very specific echo. I don't know if you can hear that on the recording, but it has a barrel vault of a ceiling and it really makes it rather ringy in this particular spot. Uh, this is an important place where I've used for 
uh, if we're doing a chant or a Renaissance piece, uh, something that might be have sung in a monastery, to help get the people in the congregation the sense of having the singers right among them, in the midst of them. So we do this about maybe 5% of the time of the anthems that we do. There's one anthem in particular, it's Tell Out My Soul, um, that we use, and I've used liturgical dance with it, where we use the entire space. We might start from the beginning, uh, in the front of the chancel here, and it's a drumming and dancing piece so that I have liturgical dancers and drummers walk through and we process to the back and sing it in the back and we end up here in the middle. Uh, so we've used the space and it continues for the, in the space of one anthem. It's a very interesting and a rather unique piece. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this little tour of our place and I encourage you to look in your own worship spaces for things that might be a different perspective for where the music can come from and uh, look to see, put some music in that space in the future. Let's talk a little bit about lighting. One of the ways that you can address how your service looks visually is to consider lighting. And I know probably many of you are of, in a church where there are just very old light switches which turn all the lights on and all the lights off. But maybe you have some luxury, some of additional uh, type of switches, so maybe some for some fixtures and maybe another switch for a different fixture and so forth, or different areas or different sides of your uh, worship space. If you think about where the action occurs and see if you can adjust light to focus on that action, it changed the perspective of the worship service from just sitting in the pew and listening to being more of a visual experience. Here at First Church, we designed, with the help of a lighting designer, uh, where we have lights in our meeting house, and we have a new system that's installed, and I'm gonna show you some of the capabilities uh, that this new system has. And some of this may be expensive, but you can also look at some individual fixtures uh, to have installed separately with a separate switch uh, to operate for specific uh, occasions or specific types of services. And it makes a big difference as far as changing the perspective and changing the mood of the service. So let's take a look at some of the things that we've done here. So I'm up here sitting in the balcony and uh, I have the camera focused on our worship area toward the front of the uh, chancel. And this is our normal uh, setting for a Sunday service. So you can see it's nice and bright. Uh, this is uh, late in the evening because I wanted to give you uh, a full expectation of what the lighting can do. Uh, but even on a bright day or if it's a cloudy day, the amount of light that you have in a worship space really makes it pop and makes it feel warm and welcoming. So one of the other settings that we have, which I'll adjust here now, is for evening services. And if you notice, it's a little bit softer light. So it's not as bright as it would be during the day. Uh, and it has a little bit more of a welcoming atmosphere. Uh, we do have some specific settings of these lights for special occasions as part of the service. So, for, for example, for the sermon, you'll notice that the lighting actually gets a little bit softer, even during the day. And we have special lights that we can focus the attention for whatever is happening. For example, here you'll see that the lights go on for the lectern. So for the Bible readings or for prayers, uh, this is where that would be. And here is the area for the pulpit. All right, so you can see that that is nice and bright. It automatically causes your eyes to focus on that area of the room. For Sunday services, many times I have the choir say, sing at the top of the steps. So we do have uh, lights that 
fill up that space. Then we also have uh, a communion area, which is in front of the steps. And you can see that I've lit up that space a little bit more. Let's turn those off. And for the collection, normally what would end up happening is the ministers would uh, receive the collection and give a short prayer of dedication from the altar section. So as you can see, we can light that up. We also have a few other settings that we use, in a, as for example, in a, a uh, uh, concert setting, which would have the steps. And the communion area, that area in the front, really lit up. And it would have the other lighting in the area is much softer. So for special concerts, if it's gonna be right in that area, that lights that up pretty, pretty nicely. So again, this is a, a very elaborate and uh, well thought out system and it's used every Sunday for bringing the attention of the worshipers eyes to the location that you want them to be in. Once again, you don't necessarily have to have such an elaborate system but you can purchase additional lighting at a fairly reasonable cost, a couple hundred dollars, uh, and have them operated on a separate switch for special things like the pulpit or like uh, other parts in the service where you're going to be having uh, the choir sing. I'm here with Sue Aziz. Uh, I first met her as part of a concert series that I was singing in and I happened to notice these fantastic colossal puppets that were in a church that we performed in. And when I inquired who made them and how could I get a hold of that person, uh, that's how I, uh, she, I got in touch with her. And it's been a great time. We've uh, collaborated on an event for uh, a special concert that we did here, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But I just wanted to uh, thank you for coming and spending some time with us and talking with us a little bit about how you how these colossal puppets came into being. Thank you, Jim. I'm so happy to have this chance to come and talk to the members of the UCCMA. Um, just hearing you say that about how a puppet can spark an imagination or touch someone's mind in a certain way, that, that means the world to me. So I'm really excited to be here and, and thank you all for letting me um, be part of this conversation today. Great. So, yeah. Uh, so how did, how did these colossal puppets come into being? Um, I have three daughters who all grew up in the church that you refer to, St. Michael's Episcopal Parish in Litchfield, Connecticut. And at a certain point in their church school time, uh, all of the sort of the parents in the church school looked around and thought, "We'd like to do something uh, lovely to celebrate Christmas, a pageant, maybe, but we thought we probably needed something beyond the model of dressing your children in bathrobes and having them parade around the space. That was maybe just." the year that we were having wasn't going to be satisfying anymore to do that. And it happens, this is a true story, that in the fall of that same year, our musician and choir director had gone to Disney. And I had seen The Lion King on Broadway, so we were feeling very grandiose and thought, what if we really changed the model? And instead of having the children represent the figures in the story, if we create puppets to help tell that story. There are a lot of good things about that. And the bad things, we didn't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you changed this model in this way, you, you, what, what were some of the things that happened? I would say there were, there were at least three, and as I get through it, maybe more layers of change that happened. One was, um, one was for the people who created the puppets. Suddenly, the whole parish was involved with this effort. Um, I uh, 
was one of the main designers of the original set of puppets. They are not the same format that we use today. The original ones were made of paper mache, and they were beautiful. Uh, there were eight of them, we called them the Big Eight, the main figures in the story, Mary, Joseph, uh, three shepherds, three wise men, and a manger. Um, made of paper mache, and uh, after two years of using them, they were victim of a flood. And there was a big mess of paper mache and mold and mildew, and so those ones had to be abandoned. And gratifyingly, though, in that moment, the pair said, no, don't stop with this presentation. Let's figure out a different way forward. So the format that I'll show in a minute came to be out of that first um, first generation, now we have the second generation. So I would say the first result is that the whole parish came together in a certain way to help make this happen. A lot of volunteer hands to um, make these really big figures, right? The, I would say the second thing that happened was that the children who were animating these puppets uh, literally embodied, like they were inside the puppets. Do you know what I mean? They were um, engaged in a really interesting way. They were, they were um, taking part in that storytelling by carrying this puppet around. I think it was a mental shift for them. I, I really do. That was interesting to see. Um, also, practically speaking, we structured it so that no one had any lines to learn. Right? So that there was a narrator who read the whole story and we chose the carols and hymns to punctuate the, um, the storytelling. Here come the angels, here's an angel carol. You know, here come the shepherds, here's a shepherd carol. So the puppeteers really only had one thing to do, which is listen. Well, two things to do, listen and then walk around. Um, so we tried to make it easier on the participants, right? At the beginning, in the first years, we were very serious about the theater aspect of this. Everyone wore black, they wore shoes that didn't make any sound. It was very focused on the appearance of the puppets. And that had a huge impact. But the community aspect of it has sort of evolved also. And so now, the pictures that you'll see of the St. Michael's presentation of this story in this way, People are wearing what they're wearing, you know, a parka, the, you know, the glory angels are sort of drifting around, and it's much more for the people who are telling the story rather than the audience. Do you know what I mean? So in terms of engagement, it's sort of a, a, a contrast to see that happen. No longer do we care that we can see the person under there. That's not that important. What seems to be the focus now is we're telling the story together. So that's kind of cool. And that leads me to the last thing, the last, I think, um, really a sort of profound impact is that it, people are really touched by this. I was shocked. I was so, uh, you know, had my head in the game of getting everything ready for that first performance. And after that, that presentation, the first year, to look up and see tears on the faces of people who had watched it, I, I had no idea that would be the outcome. That was, that was, made me want to do it again. <laughs> it, that was very moving. I, I need to say, I'm not an expert in the liturgy. That's not where I come from. I come from the theater world. I'm an artist, I make puppets. Um, but I'm really interested in, in engagement, right? And I think that's where, that's where my interest is in puppetry and church. I grew up in a church. I, um, I celebrate these holidays from a spiritual standpoint. I'm no expert, though. I think that's important to say. And yet I think there's a role for that kind of storytelling. Well, it really, it really does engage the person. I know when we've had the puppets here, and we've had, had them walk the, the nice aspect of this is that they actually walk right. through 
the building close to the people as opposed to having the people just sit in the back and then watch everything up in front. You actually have them process through the congregation and they're just looking up to see what's going on is, is quite remarkable. <laughs> It is remarkable. You know, I don't know if you have this in your parish. I think there's a little discomfort among the pew sitters to look around the room. Mm. You know, I think people are uh, don't feel free to do that. Right. Uh, they. It's a. It's kind of like I'm sitting in my pew and I'm supposed to look forward. So to invite the viewer to really turn and realize, oh my gosh, here come the angels. You know kings are behind me if I turn around and look. I think that's um, kind of liberating to do that. Do you have that experience here too? There's yes. a little resistance to yes. that. Yes. As a matter of fact, when we do the presentation here, what we've done is we have the choir and uh, a trombone choir, a 12-piece trombone choir, and all the music comes from the balcony instead of in the front. So, not only are they seeing this in front, but they're getting the sense, the oral sense, the audio sense, from behind. Yeah. So that, again, changes the perspective on yeah. how the worship actually goes. Right. Cool. That sounds, that sounds really exhilarating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, can you describe anything else about the nativity presentation and, and how is it as it fits? I know you, you made a, an, a modification of the service from the original story and you incorporated a, a new aspect of that. Um, I, let me know if this gets to what you're asking me. Uh, when we present this nativity colossal puppet, presentation at St. Michael's. It's during a normal um, Sunday Mass, with the exception of the, the, the fact that it's usually the Sunday nearest Epiphany, so whatever special service order happens, um, we choose to do it at Epiphany. Um, we uh, um, We do this presentation instead of the sermon, and possibly even instead of the Gospels. I don't know, I can't remember if that if the Gospel is taken away, but in the normal service order, uh, there are two readings, um, then a Gospel and then a sermon, and so there is no sermon on that day because there's um, a lot of other celebrating going on. So um, that's how we typically do it. We. Again, going back to the reason why we started using puppets to begin with, I was um, one of those parents who felt overwhelmed by Christmas. And there was already so much happening at school and in all of the clubs that my kids were involved in and the church school and everything else to try to do a, um, a Christmas celebration during Advent. I, I would have to say that would have that would have been too much for me. So uh, again, there are uh, many good outcomes from this. We would um, tilt toward the end of the story, right? Uh, so that our children could remember that Christmas was a season, not just a day. And so we emphasize the three kings. And so uh, presenting on Epiphany helped everyone stay excited about Christmas. Right, and until the season was really fully over, and we had um, a, a strong portion of the story about the the wise men, the wise guys, as they <laughs> and then in fact the uh, Herod and the slaughter of the innocents uh, is in there too, because that leads into the you know the seasons that follow. So. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it was sort of a like a stress relief valve to not have to do it before Christmas Day, and then we spend a lot of Christmas vacation, you know, unpacking these puppets and steaming them and putting them together. 
So that's that was like part of vacation tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Working on the pump. So yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah. So, uh, what are the nativity puppets themselves like? It's a form and function going hand in hand. Um, this is the figure of Mary, and she's standing in her stand, which um, keeps her safe and upright. I have to laugh at our team thinking it was years of doing this puppet production before we realized, oh, if we made stands, then we could set them down safely. Before that, there was a lot of leaning of big puppets against the wall, and that was always a little risky. So when we figured out the stands, that um, turned out to be huge influence and in what we could do. So the stand is a two by two square of, I forget if it's plywood or medium density fiberboard, and it just has a um, plumbing flange screwed to the center of it. Uh, the vertical pipe there um, does come off. It's easier to store a stack of them that way. I think we have 15 or so of them. This is useful for when there's a puppet who begins in one location and finishes the story in a different location. So we have stands for them in both places. So that works out well. So this PVC is in, not intended to slide through here, but it does. And um, I think this is a one inch pipe. That's plenty robust to hold up the weight of this puppet. Um, PVC doesn't accept paint very well, but you know, a little touch up every now and then and it's uh, that's an easy job to do. So the black um, pole under there kind of disappears when the puppeteer is there. Um, so as I said, the lace in the front panel means that the puppeteer inside can really see very clearly. The fabric in the back is also lightweight. Um, and the fabric of the headdress also lightweight. We really chose the fabric for how much it weighed um, to keep everything manageable because we really thought these were little, uh, you know, young children in here. So when we get up to here, this is the sauna tube. I can't undo her hand pose. These are just rubber gloves and the um, iconic white lilies. But here's, the, here's her shoulder plate. Um, it's right here. So that gives her a little bulk in the shoulder. And so the drapery falls straight down from there to the hula hoop at the bottom. And that keeps the puppeteer from tripping. All of that designed for safety. Right? Um, up inside the sauna tube, maybe we'll be able to see it from the back. The structure, oh, yeah, the, the, there's a fitting here that's threaded. So when I put her in my car to take her back home, this pole just rotates, us, just rotates off. So I'm left with the head, which is already pretty big. So when, um, when she goes into storage, it's sort of uh, striking closet full of puppet heads. Um, the, the PVC in her neck is just one inch wide. We tried to make it look less um, precarious by putting the white fabric there. I think all of the figures have a kind of a, a scarf or a wimple of some kind to sort of disguise the teeny little structure that's in their neck. And then uh, the foam of her face is a piece of foam like an upholstery foam with some extra styrofoam balls that are shaped uh, to create the facial features. And then the faces of all of these figures uh, is um, elastic spandex fabric so that in stretching 
fabric over the foam behind there and pinning in some strategic places, uh, you see a face, a little bit of painting, just suggestive of a face. And we did it with fabric that way because we were afraid that we would have to replace that element. We haven't. That's 17 years later. The faces are still as they were. Um, so that's turned out to be more durable than any of us imagined. Um, but up close you can see the pins, but after a little bit of distance I think the pins go away. We also made a point of putting something sparkly on all of the eyes so that they, when they do catch the light, give a, a nice um, sense of liveliness. So that is the format of Mary. When she's carried, is it all right with you if I carry her? Mm -hmm. the, um, the really important thing for these figures is that the taller they are, the slower the puppeteer should walk. Walking fast with one of these is, um, doesn't, it just doesn't look right. They're sort of majestic and they want to glide. Oh, I can tell already. I messed up her. They do best when they glide. I can tell from inside here where she's looking based on where her shoulders are. So ideally, you put her down in that stand and pose her the way you want before you step out from under. We decided now 20 years ago, I'm not sure I would do it again this exact way, but I wanted to make sure that the, the sort of cultural identity of these figures was up to interpretation. So we, chose, we started with Mary, because blue goes with Mary in classical art. Um, but we chose to make her face blue too, because we didn't want to decide a different choice for what her face should be. So after we made the decision for her, then every character is head to toe that same color. So Mary is the lovely Mary in blue. And she's the only one with hands. She has rubber gloves as her hands, um, so she can hold a lily, which is a symbol of Mary also. Joseph is red, head to toe. Um, the shepherds are brown and gray. And the three kings are purple, green, and orange. So the primary colors are the Holy Family, and then as we descend out from them, um, the, the colors, uh, we have secondary colors, and then to neutrals. We really struggled with how to depict the baby Jesus. That seemed beyond any of us, um, seemed too important. Uh, so we made a manger and we filled it with lights. So the baby Jesus is represented by the light, that's the light of the world. And so there's no human figure in there. 
It's mm. just the light. And that seems to be satisfying. Um, and dodged the serious question of how to depict that baby. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, yeah. I, know, I know when we presented it here, one of the things that we use is the beginning of John, the Gospel of yes, John. Yes, yes. And it's talking about the light of yes, the world. Yes, yes. So it, it was, it's perfect. It's yeah, a nice it way to yes. tie that in. Yeah, yeah. I, um, there's an image uh, of sort of the tableau uh, as it is at St. Michael's with the, um, the manger in the middle and all the shepherds to one side and all the kings to the other side, Mary and Joseph in the middle. I didn't mention the angels. There are two angels, and they do have hands besides Mary. They do. One is the angel Gabriel, and depending on how many strong people we have who are game to do it, sometimes Gabriel is a vertical figure, and sometimes he's a flying figure. If we have someone who can carry the hoop that's the, the bottom of his skirt, he's horizontal and, and takes two people to travel him through. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's just depends on the people who are around that year. And then the other the other angel is we call him Harold, but he's the Harold angel who appears to the shepherds. Uh, they are so afraid. I understand that when you do it here, your shepherds quake with yeah, fear. I love that. <laughs> that's, so that's cool. brilliant. That's brilliant. And I think I mentioned that the littlest children who carry the. Um, paper foil stars trail behind the angels when they walk. And then they, they go back and sit with their families and keep those stars. And so if you're standing in the back of the room and you look through the congregation up to the front, there's stars hither and yon sort of um, flickering around because those kids are still have the stars. That's sort of a nice, uh, a nice thing. I like that. One of the things that uh we like with this again is being able to involve the children yes on that morning yes or just before the service without any rehearsal time without any fanfare or any any pomp or circumstance right they just come up one of the favorite things that they are are the sheep oh can you describe the sheep i one? can i can the sheep are um a late addition, I have to say. There was some clamoring, why aren't there sheep? So we made the sheep out of um, black uh, oven mitts, that's the face, and then a piece of sheepskin fabric. So the puppeteer has a, a sheep head on their hand, their ears that go this way, and I think the eyes are yellow sort of sparkly eyes, and then just the sheepskin over their arms, so the sheep poke out between the shepherds and go up the aisle, or whatever you want to do with them. Yeah. That's pretty funny, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to think it was, there were a lot of animals. We had, we had at one time a camel. Um, t it was so big, the cam a camel to be in the right proportion with a 10 foot tall king. So sometimes that's unwieldy. Yeah. Um, there's already a lot going on. <laughs> but I think your point is right. There's the, the ways of being involved don't necessarily require a lot of rehearsal. There's a lot of prep time, but it's putting the puppets together. Uh, so it's the team of people who get, get it all ready. Those people are working hard up to the, um, the day of the presentation. And we have, we have lists. We, we try to use, like you do here, every possible corner of the sanctuary so that people coming from the front and from the back and from stage left and stage right and swirling around. And, and so there are adults who know what the plan is at every entrance and can say, OK, this is the angel part. You know, it's your turn. And so the children just can relax and be, be in it mm. in, in that way. Yeah, that works. Yeah. So we had the uh, opportunity to work on a, a different project uh, for uh, a Paul Winter concert yes. that we did here. Yes. And how was that different? Oh, that was, that was very special for me. The, I think the way it was alike 
was listening to um, a story, I'm trying to picture how puppetry could help bring it to life. So those are the things that are in common. But in the Paul Winter case, it, it was really hearing the animal sounds. And I think you and I decided early on that um, we would want to feature those animals and in, in this space, which uh, to me, this space was almost as influential in the way I developed those puppets as the music itself. So um, the height and the quality of light here uh, really helped me see. If you remember the condor puppet, so that was um, one that you and I decided would be a, a really um, visually uh, significant thing to bring in here. The test piece that I did was small and short compared to what it ended up being. I thought I was making this enormous thing with you know, a really high loft. And when I got it here, I thought, oh, it could go higher. Right? And then, um, so uh, being able to do something specifically for this room, specifically for that uh, piece of music was so exciting for me. I will say something too that, um, that is important about the um, Earth Mass performance here. I think the really successful ele the puppetry elements that succeeded the best were the tall ones. Because, like St. Michael's First Church here, the meeting house is a level audience, if you will. And so if after about the fourth row, it becomes challenging to see something that's at the same level that you're on as a pew sitter, right? So when you want to engage the audience with something um, like a puppet, the higher it is, the better it is. I was excited to use the wolves, if you'll remember. There are wolves in the earth mass, and so that became the thing, oh, let's see if the wolves can be part of it too. But remembering that our beginning characters were the whale, the condor, and a flock of seagulls, all of those have a sort of airborne or waterborne habitat, right, so that um, they could use the vertical space. The wolves were masked characters, and I truly appreciated the um, engagement, one-on-one -on -one really, of the masked performers who came through the space with the wolf heads on. There were three of them, and they came through. Um, but if you weren't sitting on an aisle, you might not even have been aware of them. So that was, uh, I think a, a success, but a second layer success. To me, the first layer of success was the stuff that you could see from anywhere. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So um, saying, saying the same thing about the nativity puppets, the, the point is that they were visible from anywhere and they moved around the space. So anyone in the room had the opportunity to see them, if not when they were featured in the in the reading or in the music, at least at some point. So to try to turn the puppet around so it goes back down the aisle, you know, so if you didn't see it face on, then you did when it turned. Do you know what I mean? And I think that, um, that using those animals in the space, again, reinforced that and, and drove it home for me even more. The higher, the better. And you have the perfect setting. Flying in condor in the, <laughs> inside the meeting house. That was um, that was amazing. Yeah. Well, Susan, thank you so much for spending some time with us and talking a little bit about the process. And I'm really hoping that uh, people will reach out. Uh, we have a question and answer session, yes. which will be following yes. this uh, session. 
And there will also be some resources, as you mentioned, that will be on the website that they can download and take a look at. And I encourage just questions back and forth. Uh, the chat will be available for about 30 days after this conference. Oh, great. Great. So I can monitor that, and if there's any specific questions, I can follow up on it and get back to them on it. Sure. It's really, really, really important to make sure that what you're offering is visible to everyone. And uh, if you present something that isn't isn't visible, then it's almost more frustrating for the viewer to know that it happened and they missed it. Do you know what I mean? As a way of, as a, if it's an invitation to engage beyond what uh, they would expect to have in a normal church service on a regular Sunday, I keep saying the word normal, but you know, um, very important to make sure that you really do think of all the ways to make it possible for everyone to see it. Whether that's because of the height, or because it moved, or maybe because the congregation has moved by it. That, I think that's really important. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>